So this first lecture is just to give you an overview of what viruses are and to help clarify what they are not. So the word virus actually comes from Latin, whoops, meaning a venomous substance or poison or slimy liquid. This was before um, people knew that viruses were these little um, particles. And this really just shows you the two basic types of viruses. Um, one is called naked. And what's shown in blue is what we call a capsid. So a capsid is a protein shell. And what's kind of curly Q here in, in pink is the nucleic acid. So this is the genome of the virus. And it can be DNA or it can be RNA. And we'll talk in a little bit. It can be double-stranded or single-stranded. It can have multiple pieces or single pieces, uh, circular or linear. So a basic virus, all viruses, are made up of a capsid, protein shell, and genetic information. Enveloped viruses, which is this type, means that this thing in purple is a phospholipid bilayer. And when we talk about how viruses exit the cells in um, the next lecture about the replication cycle, you'll see that this phospholipid bilayer is basically stolen from the cell membrane, either part of the endomembrane system or the outside um, plasma cell membrane. Um, and then there'll be some virus-specific proteins also on the outside. But you can see that inside the envelope, there's still a capsid and there's still genetic information. Okay. So a virus must have genetic information, must be surrounded by a capsid, and then we're gonna learn that viruses have other characteristics, such as some are enveloped, some package certain proteins, um, but keep this as the core of what a virus is. Um, and scientists like to debate whether viruses or are alive or not. And if you take the definition of uh, a cell as the basic unit of life, you can see that a virus is not a cell. Okay, even with phospholipid bilayer, even with encapsidating proteins, viruses don't have things like ribosomes. Um, at least most viruses, and we'll, we'll talk about um, potentially an exception to this rule. Um, but they don't do their own metabolism. Um, they are dependent on cells. So, so viruses are not cells. They're very different than bacteria. And you'll see as we go through these first couple weeks, that's why viruses, um, we have to have different strategies to deal with a virus infection than we do with a bacterial infection. Viruses are also very small. Um, you can see here's E. coli and here's Streptococcus, two very common um, bacteria. And then you can see we have um, the big pox virus. Um, this would be like smallpox, um, vaccinia herpes, all the way down um, to number nine is yellow fever, number eight is polio. Um, so much, much smaller. Um, bacterial cells are in the micrometer or micrometer size, um, 
except for these little uh, rickettsia, but there are exceptions. There's always exceptions in biology to every rule. Um, viruses are in the nanometer range. And of course, like I said, there's always exceptions. Um, we are now just learning about these giant viruses um, shown over here. So this is a megavirus. This guy is called Pandora virus. I would love it if people wanted to um, look at, into one of these for their papers um, at the end of the semester. And we're just discovering, and these guys are similar in size, um, some of them, to bacteria. So you're getting close to um, a half a micrometer um, in size with these big mega mama mimi Pandora viruses. Totally different types of structures, um, very different um, genes. Um, they th were thought to be intracellular bacteria when they were first discovered, um, but they are in fact um, a virus. And, and what makes something a virus is that it's an obligate intracellular parasite. So the obligate part means they must, 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 must be inside a cell to replicate. And they're a parasite because they eventually, for the most part, end up destroying the cell that they've infected. The next um, lecture is all about this replication cycle, so we're not going to go into um, details here. But really, the um, objective, if we wanted to give them a, a, a human thought process, a, a virus a whole goal is to infect a cell, make more virus, spread, infect a cell, make more virus. Okay. So they're using the cell, obligate intracellular, they're using the machinery inside a cell to create more viruses. They cannot do anything on their own. So a virus sitting on a desktop, in a Kleenex, um, wherever you've, you've sneezed and released it or uh, left some bodily fluids, um, they're not doing anything. They're not metabolically active like a cell, like say a bacteria or a fungi um, would be, or a fungus, I should, should, I should say. Some um, <coughs> important concepts, excuse me, <coughs> that will come up um, next week is viruses are very specific. They have a very specific host range, which means the organisms that they infect. So you're not going to give your dog or cat or guinea pig um, a cold and they're not gonna give you their virus infections because um, of the specificity. Specificity is due, and we'll talk about this um, in the next lecture, is due to receptors on a cell. Uh -oh. Once in a while, this. And also the proteins in a cell. Okay. Tissue tropism is talking about the cell types that a virus can infect. Okay, so if you come down with influenza, it doesn't infect all types of cells in your body. It stays mainly in the respiratory tract because those cells are the ones that have the receptors. Tissue tropism is also linked to transmission. 
So a lot of viruses that we deal with are airborne and they're transmitted through the respiratory route. So you sneeze, you cough, you put virus particles into the air, the next person inhales um, and the viruses go into the nose, the eyes, the lungs, and there is where they're going to find the cells they can infect. So keep these um, important concepts um, as we go into the next um, lecture. And as you start to do your wiki about your specific virus, you're going to do some research and find what is the host range, what is um, what are the tissue tropism, um, or sorry, what is the tissue tropism for your specific virus? So what kind of cells does it infect? Um, another concept I'll just throw out here um, with host range we'll talk about next week is zoonosis. So some viruses can go from animal to humans. Um, Again, it's not like cat, dog to humans. Um, some viruses have reservoirs in animals like bats or um, primates. Um, very few are domesticated um, animals to people, but rabies is an example of a zoonotic virus as well. And influenza is actually zoonotic because some of the um, influenza strains that we worry about the most um, have come from either pigs or um, birds. So another concept we'll talk about. And this image, sorry, is just to uh, illustrate that there are specific receptors for different viruses and there has to be a specific interaction between the virus and the host cell in order for the virus to infect that cell. So how were viruses discovered? So viruses were discovered back in the late 1800s, um, but the challenge was at the time um, Koch's postulates was the um, kind of golden rule for discovering a microorganism, an infectious agent. And the four components of Koch's postulates is one, the microorganism must be found and visualized, oops, from the diseased organism. Mm. Don't know why. Oh, sorry. Oh, what's my pen's having problems with? Okay, so mainly um, scientists were looking at bacteria, and you can see bacteria under a light microscope, which is the type of microscope they had back then. Um, the problem is viruses are way too small to see, so they couldn't um, see, visualize the infectious agent um, under the microscope. The second part of Cox postulates is the microbe must be isolated and grown in pure culture. And if you've taken microbiology, you know that you can grow colonies of bacteria of many types, um, and so you can, excuse me, isolate and visualize and purify them. Well, viruses require a host cell to grow on, so you can't grow them alone. They don't multiply alone. 
So we had to develop methods of growing cells and then infecting them with viruses, and they didn't have this back then. Um, the third part of Cox postulate is the microbe must cause disease when put back into a host. And viruses would have done this, but we weren't able to get from step one and step two. And a healthy host is what I'm trying to write. And the fourth part is you must be able to re-isolate the microbe from that new diseased host. So we had some challenges figuring out what viruses were. Like I said, in the late 1800s, viruses were discovered. Um, the first one was tobacco mosaic virus, TMV. And how this virus was discovered was that they found they took diseased tobacco leaves and they actually ground them up and then they filtered them. And the filter is going to stop or catch all bacteria, all cells. And what they found in this liquid filtrate So the stuff that went through the filter is that whatever was in this liquid, they could put on a plant again and, oops, sorry, I didn't go to D, ah, I'm going to follow my arrows, D, whatever they um, came through that filter, they could put on a plant and it would cause disease again. So this was something very small. Um, they called it contagium vivum fluidium, which means a contagious living fluid. So they didn't yet know that viruses were these little particles. All they knew is that they were much smaller than anything that would be held back by the filter, and it made this liquid infectious. So they started working um, with viruses this way. And it wasn't really until the invention of the electron microscope that we could start to see viruses. <clears throat> You've probably heard about the classic Hershey and Chase experiment. Um, so now we're jumping, what, 50, 60 years, um, where they wanted to determine, do viruses have DNA-like cells as genetic material? Um, and so, the, I guess the question was, do viruses use DNA as their genetic material? And Hershey and Chase We're working with a phage, this little guy up here in green, and a phage is a virus that infects bacteria. And what they could do is they labeled all the DNA with a radioactive phosphate, and if you remember, DNA has a phosphate backbone. And they took a different um, solution of bacteriophage and labeled all the protein with S35, which is sulfur. So there's no sulfur in um, DNA. So they could differentiate. And so they had the S35 protein labeled phage and the P32 DNA labeled phage. And what phage do is... Um, especially these type, these T2 phage, is they actually sit on the outside of a bacterial cell 
and they inject their genetic information there. The capsid never goes in. Okay, so the protein that they were labeling was the capsid. And the virus then has the genetic information in the bacterial cell, uses the bacterial um, machinery to make more viruses. So when they took the solution of protein labeled bacteriophage, they found that there was no sulfur inside the cells. So suggesting that the sulfur was not, or the, I'm sorry, the protein was not the genetic material because the protein stayed outside of the cell. So you weren't, aren't gonna be able to make new virus without the information in the cell. In contrast, when they infected bacteria with P32 labeled DNA and they um, removed the phage from the outside of the cell, yes, DNA radioactive was inside the cell, the phage capsids were outside. And so this gave um, evidence that the DNA was being injected from the phage into the bacterial cell that was the genetic information that was going to allow these bacterial cells to produce more phage. And this is just an electron microscope picture that has been false colored, but all these little green guys are actually bacteriophage um, on the outside of a bacterial cell. And I just think it's so amazing to look at. And you can see right here, here, the phage is actually injecting its DNA into the cell and then the protein capsid head is released. It's an empty head, it, it doesn't have any more uh, use. So where did viruses come from? Well, we really don't know. Um, there's kind of two main, some people call them three main ideas. Um, where viruses came from. The question is, were they vagrant genes? So were they genes inside a cell that kind of got loose? So genes from a cell that somehow became a virus. And one of the supporting um, factors for this is that, depending on how you count it up, five to eight percent of the hu human genome is what we call endogenous retroviruses. So they're inside our DNA. Um, they have a lot of uh, genes that look similar to retroviruses. An example of a retrovirus is HIV. So this can kind of support the, the idea that maybe these cells jumped out of the human genome. Um, or maybe viruses were degenerate cells, which means they once were cells Oops, I what I'm spelling. Once were cells and they lost their independence or their autonomy to reproduce, and so they just became these little capsids of genetic information. So you could kind of see it either way. Did the genes come from a cell? Were they a cell that now can no longer replicate? And why do we have a chunk of our genome that looks like retroviruses? So were they infecting our cell and leaving information behind? Did these genes pop out? Nobody knows. I don't know if we'll ever be able to figure it out. Um, what we do think is that viruses probably started off with RNA genomes. So probably all life started out with RNA um, because RNA has the ability to also act as an enzyme. 
So a ribozyme is an RNA with catalytic activity. So this is the RNA world hypothesis. <clears throat> and so we think that RNA was really the first genetic information. It was able to um, self-replicate. Um, from there, somehow proteins came into play. And if you remember, translation is RNA to proteins. And now I've kind of mentioned that some viruses only have RNA genomes, so there's not a need for DNA. And we think that eventually, eventually, DNA became the genetic material because it's more stable, because it's double-stranded. So it's more stable than <coughs> RNA. Um, in the biochemical sense. Um, also, if you look at mutation rates, you're going to see that the highest mutation rates are in RNA viruses. And as you get to DNA viruses and then you get to cells, you have a much lower mutation rate. So you can imagine that having an RNA genome would have been an advantage as the first genetic information because it could mutate and try out and make eventually different proteins. And when everything kind of worked out really well, DNA could come along and become this <clears throat> stable material um, to hold that genetic information. Um, we talk about viruses um, sometimes based on shape, and this is shape of um, the capsid. So the two most common types are um, filamentous, which is um, also called helical, and we'll look at this. It's it's <coughs> excuse me, really this capsid that kind of looks like a slinky. And um, here's an example um, of probably measles, I don't remember, but you can kind of see the outline of the genetic information, the capsid, I'm sorry, in the genetic information as these helical um, filamentous capsids. The next type is isometric, which um, kind of looks circular, but <clears throat> is really uh, very geometrical. I'll show you some examples in a minute. So we're not talking about the envelope shape here, um, but rather the capsid shape inside. And then of course, as always, we have ex uh, exceptions to every rule. So we have the complex viruses um, that have maybe a combination of filamentous and isometric. So here's your T4 phage. It's got an isometric head. It's got a filamentous part right here. Um, pox viruses, if you see some, <clears throat> actually look like a dumbbell shape. Um, and Mimi viruses um, have kind of multiple capsids <coughs> around them. Oh, so here's my picture. Um, so filamentous, again, if you looked at the proteins that make up the capsid, it goes around like this, kind of like a like a slinky. Um, this is called, we see this term here, nucleocapsid. So nucleocapsid means there's a tight interaction with the genome. So we'll see some capsids, <coughs> excuse me, some capsids have the genetic information kind of floating around and some are tightly, so in green here is the RNA, um, kind of green here is um, the RNA also. Some have the capsid tightly um, connected with the genetic information, so we call that a nucleocapsid. <coughs> 
The second common um, type of capsid shape is isometric or icosahedral. And I just want you to see that um, it's made up of these geometric subunits. So these are all different proteins that make up the shell. And then inside is going to be the genetic information. Um, so this is something you're going to include in your wiki, the shape of the capsid for your virus. Um, the outside of the virus, whether it has an envelope or whether it's naked, is really important for binding the receptor. And remember that receptor binding is how the virus specifically acts with <clears throat> a type of tissue or a cell that it can infect. And again, we'll talk about this more, um, but sometimes you'll see spikes on the outsides of viruses that you can imagine interacting with a receptor. And sometimes it's actually the canyons or these indents in the capsid that interact with the receptor. Classification. So this was quite a challenge. How are we going to group viruses? Should we base it on morphology, which is shape, like we just talked about? Should we base it on the host it infects? And I've already mentioned that some viruses can infect multiple types of hosts, like rabies can infect, say, dogs and humans. Should we classify them on pathology? What they do to the infected organism or the disease they cause? Well, none of these work really well. Um, and so what um, the virologists have decided to do for classification is based on nucleic acid. So what type of genetic information does a virus have? And the reason for this is because this tells you actually a lot about how the virus reproduces and some of the general characteristics. Um, so you can see here, RNA viruses can have different morphologies they could be naked or enveloped. They can have <clears throat> double-stranded, positive, negative sense, and, and they look quite, quite different. Okay. Same with um, DNA viruses. So the current method of classification is called the Baltimore classification system. Okay, and so this is based on the type of genetic information uh, let's let's actually write this a different because I don't want to really say genetic information this is based on the type of genome so there's seven classes class one through seven okay. and um, the, the idea is how do they get to mRNA? Because mRNA is what's translated to protein. Protein produces your viral proteins that allow for the next cycle to happen, right? So it allows to make a new um, virus. And so as you can see as we go through here, we have double-stranded DNA viruses that can be directly transcribed to mRNA. We have single-stranded DNA viruses that have to replicate to double-stranded before they can be transcribed. And we have some double-stranded DNA viruses that are a little different because they go through this mRNA um, 
back to double-stranded DNA replication. So these are actually have some, um, sorry, some uh, RNA-dependent, uh, no, what do I want to say, some reverse transcription uh, capabilities. Um, we have RNA viruses that have a positive sense, um, which means they can be directly translated. We have um, right here, oh sorry, that's where I'm getting myself mixed up. Class 6 uh, is that they go under reverse transcription, this is like HIV, before their genes can be transcribed. Other single-stranded positive sense RNAs, viruses can be directly translated. There's double-stranded RNA viruses um, oops, up here, and there's negative sense RNA viruses um, that have to undergo um, a round of what we call transcription to make more, to make positive sense RNA. This will make more sense as everybody starts presenting. Um, we have viruses from every class um, except the single-stranded DNA. There's just not a lot of them um, and not uh, medically relevant um, viruses. But you will get to look at um, all of these different classifications. And this one is just another image of the Baltimore classification system. And so now I've put some viruses you may may not have heard from, heard from, heard about, um, and some of the ones that we're going to be going through. So your job in your wiki is to explain to us how your genome um, is expressed. I also want you to just um, understand that the size of the genome and the number of protein coding genes can vary immensely with viruses. Okay. So here we have HIV that actually has a pretty small, less than 10 kb genome size and only encodes for about nine genes as compared to some larger viruses, um, like these Pandora viruses, have um, almost a 2.5 um, I don't know, what am I saying? Megabyte, megabyte, um, oh my gosh, my brain. 2.5 million um, base pairs of genetic information, and these actually encode, where's my Pandora? Um, over a thousand proteins. So these are really big, uh, much more complex um, viruses. Um, and then you have something like lambda phage, which has a pretty big genome and encodes about 66 genes. So needless to say, considering that our cells encode about 22,000 genes, viruses, you can imagine, are dependent upon cells because they don't carry all the genetic information required for the metabolism and for the protein uh, translation. Um, a little bit about taxonomy, just how viruses are named. Um, ICTV is the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. And here are the endings. Um, this is rarely used, um, except if you're um, discovering a new virus and you need to put it into the classification system. <clears throat> Here's an example for the human respiratory syncytial virus, um, RSV. Um, this shows you its order, family, subfamily, genus. 
Um, we're really focusing on um, usually at the genus level. Sometimes they talk about them at the family level. Um, please, I should put H human, make sure that you define the full virus name before you start using the abbreviation. Even though most of us know what HIV is, if you're picking HIV, make sure you first tell us it's human immunodeficiency virus in parentheses um, HIV. So this information is out there, but like I said, um, many times we just call them also by um, common names. So look that up for your virus. Um, see what information you can find. Okay, just to kind of end this talk, <clears throat> what a virus is and is not. So you may come across these terms called um, a viroid. And a viroid is a single-stranded RNA molecule does not encode any protein these are only found in plants wow. um, but they're infectious they're disease causing and what we think is um, that somehow um, these RNA molecules are interfering with host genetic information, silencing some of the host response to a virus infection or to a viroid infection and causing disease that way. Um, so viroids are pretty interesting, but they're not technically a virus. They don't have um, a capsid. Um, a satellite virus um, is something that can have an RNA or a DNA genome. Um, it has a capsid, but the capsid is still, um, well, let me back up, but it requires co-infection with what we call a helper virus. So this is hepatitis D, virion, <clears throat> and it must be infected in the same cell with hepatitis B. And it actually steals the capsid from hepatitis B. So hepatitis B has the genetic information to help, oh, excuse me, hepatitis D replicate. So hepatitis D virus does not encode its own replication proteins, um, doesn't encode its own capsid proteins. So it's some genetic information that actually steals um, the coat and um, has to be infected with a helper virus. So these satellite viruses, um, we're not really going to consider um, as viruses for this class. And then what definitely is not a virus, um, but is an infectious unit, are prions. And prions are infectious proteins. And you might have heard of mad cow disease. Um, or bovine spongiform encephalitis, BSE. So these are caused by a protein that misfolds. And for some reason, <clears throat> if this normal protein misfolds, it can make a chain reaction. It triggers other healthy proteins to misfold. And pretty soon, these misfolded proteins will clump in cells and cause cell death. 
So it's a no protein. You have prion, normal prion <coughs> proteins in your brain. Um, but if they misfold, or if you, say, eat a diseased cow, and you get that misfolded protein up into your brain, it will trigger all your normal proteins to misfold, cause clumps in your brain, cause cell death, um, and um, these are related to neurodegenerative diseases because a lot of times they'll trigger death of neurons in the brain, your brain doesn't function anymore, and you die. What's crazy about prions is even though they're proteins, they're not affected by pH, they are not affected by um, heat, and the only way to destroy a prion is to incinerate it, so you gotta burn it up. Um, and it's, it's hard to figure out um, why these things are so resistant, but there's a lot of work that's looking at um, the relationship between prions and neurodegenerative diseases. So, not a virus, a really cool thing. Unfortunately, we're not going to talk about it in this class. All right, so hopefully from this lecture you kind of understand more of what a virus is, some of its general characteristics, and then um, some of the um, aspects that I want you to find in your wiki about your specific virus, um, and then the next lecture will be on the general virus replication cycle. All right, thank you.